people today. Yeah. Yeah, and it's for me, it's 2 a.m. Yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah, welcome. I'm Robert. I'm from Sweden, and uh, I work as a developer. I've been doing that for about 20, 25 years. I also work as a trainer uh, with Microsoft uh, on the Microsoft platform, SQL Server and uh, C Sharp and, and the, the entire stack, really. Okay, so let's get on. I'll start with a brief introduction to DDD. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so, so I can't cover the whole, whole topic. Just a few minutes. To, to, I, I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with it. Uh, we, uh, the book is great. Read the book. Um, that's a good start. But uh, DDD is about uh, focusing on the domain model. And, and most developers are pretty poor at that because we like uh, a lot of shiny tools. We like our... We like our technology, and we tend to focus on that. And one of the things, one of the points the book brings up is that um, the skilled, the experienced developers, they get to work on the frameworks and the technical stuff, and then they leave, then they leave the field, and the juniors get to work with the domain stuff and fill in, the, fill in using the architecture that the experienced devs built. And that's pretty backwards, according to the book. So read the book. There's a lot of wisdom in it from, a lot of, from experienced developers. Um, so you should get it and read it. All right. Um, so focusing on the domain, that's one thing. And um, using a, a, consist a consistent language across the development team, across the analysis and, and uh, uh, the domain and business experts should all use the same language. And it's, uh, you should work with modeling. And the, the book uses a lot, a lot of UML modeling. And you all like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, UML is, well, it's just a visual language for expressing things. As, and as, as long as you're not uh, designing the entire system with UML and then generating code and you think the, f the system's f finished after that, if you use it just to, just to visualize and, and communicate, it's, it's pretty, pretty good. I'm a visual per person myself, so I enjoy that. Yeah, so a lot of modeling, and it's, uh, it's pretty focused on object-oriented modeling. But... Uh, Recent development, uh, we see a lot of uh, functional. You've seen that, right? It's a lot of functional uh, modeling in, in domain modeling. The book mentions it, but, but um, it's, it's basically object-oriented. It uses a lot of patterns. You've seen these uh, aggregates, uh, and the aggregate pattern. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, the aggregate is for, uh, for boundaries for consistency and transaction boundaries. The point, the point with an aggregate is uh, you load an aggregate into memory, and then you, do, you perform some operations on it, and then you save it back. And it has to be an isolated object graph. It can't have a bunch of references to other objects because you have to find the boundaries. That's kind of the purpose of the, the aggregate. And then we, we have the basic entity objects, the, the just the plain old objects that you're used to. Uh, value objects uh, correspond to like structs. They're, they're uh, immutable value types, they don't have an uh, identity, they have copy by value semantics. Yeah, events, services, repository. Uh, yeah, the repository um, concept comes from this book also. It's one of the patterns of the book. It was uh, very popular, but it's becoming unpopular now, right? Repositories are evil, you've heard that? Okay. Yeah, well, the, the main point with DDD, that's, it's focusing on the domain. And I, th I feel that the book is a, is a bit outdated because of, uh, it, it's a lot of patterns and a lot of specific patterns, these things with aggregates and, and services and repositories. So they're, they're a bit old, but the, the basic idea of focusing on the domain is, is really good. And I'll get back to why, why I think some of these are, are getting old. And one of them was like uh, there's a shift from, uh, from object-oriented to functional. That's one of the things. So, so I feel a lot of these patterns are biased towards, uh, towards persistence. Working with CRUD, you have to load something from the database, and then you work on it in memory, and then you have to save it back, moving stuff back and forth between, uh, between the database and your application. A lot of these patterns are biased towards, towards that. 
All right, so, so that was DDD. I'm not going to talk so much more about DDD, but I'll show you a, an approach to focusing on the, on the domain, and that's uh, Origo DB. It's an open source project that I'm, uh, I've been working with for the past five years. And actually, it's, it's an approach that I, I've been using uh, since the 90s. Since 95, when, when, when Java first came, I tried out uh, object output stream. You remember those? You could write, a, write, an, object, write an object graph to a stream. And uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see some things from there. OK, so I'm a lazy uh, developer. Uh, I like to do as little work as possible. I'm getting old. I, I, I don't have time to play with uh, tools. I hate computers. I don't like it when they, when they uh, give me a bunch of trouble. So I want to do as little work as possible, and I, I like to solve problems and, and make the clients happy with as little work as possible. Uh, and uh, here's one of the things that, uh, that's bothered me since, uh, yeah, for the past 20 years. All right, yeah, so uh, we've got a domain layer, and in the domain layer, we want to focus on, on the domain, so we write a bunch of object-oriented object code, uh, probably, or some other code. And that's where we put our logic and, and yeah, the domain logic. And uh, the rest of it, to the right of it, we, have, we also have a relational model, and then we have a lot of uh, code to move the da data back and forth between the database and the application. And it feels, it feels like a, a duplicated model. The, the re relational model, when, when it was um, developed, was kind of uh, the purpose of it was, was to represent the domain, right? That's what we were supposed to do with relational modeling. And uh, the, the SQL language was intended to be as close to a natural language as, as possible. So that, that was kind of intended as an ubiquitous language at the time. But we've, we've kind of outgrown that. We don't want to work with uh, relational. We want to work object-oriented. And now we have the, these dual models. So we, we, have a du we have the relational model because we have to use it, or that's because that's the way we always do it. And then we have the object-oriented model, and then we have to map between them. And, and, and that's just crazy for me. It's doing, doing two things and then putting something in between, and, uh, and they don't really map uh, like we all know, so it puts, it puts a lot of constraints on what we can do on our, on our domain object-oriented domain model. I overheard some, some people here talking about uh, OR mapping, and they said that uh, don't do many-to-many -many mapping because you'll, get in, you'll, you'll just get in trouble with OR mapping. But that's silly. If, if I want to do that in, in, um, in object-oriented modeling, then I should be able to. It's, the, the, the mapping and the data layer shouldn't impose constraints on, on the modeling we do in our domain layer. Right, so basically what you do with OrigoDB is you, these things are eliminated. The data access layer and the re relational, relational database, they're gone. And that saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of time and work, and it, it allows us to express more things in the domain layer because we're, we're really, really free to do what we want. OK. Yeah, so how does it work? It's, it's based on one, one simple idea. And here's a... Uh, two seconds there. You recognize uh, this? It's uh, from systems theory. We have, the, we have a system state. The initial state is the first state, and then we have an operation. And the op operation that transforms, uh, moves the state to, uh, to the next state. So we have a sequence of operations, and each state is a, f is a functional dependency of the sequence of operations and, and the initial state, right? It's kind of a formula for that. And uh, you'll also recognize the transactional theory here. If, uh, if the state can be the state of the database, and the operations are, are transactions. 
So if we think about the acid properties of transactions, then a, a transaction moves the state from one consistent state to the next state uh, atomically. So anything in between is invisible to uh, other transactions. So, so there, there we have isolation. And, but the durability is a bit, a bit, a bit different. In, in a traditional system, you have a transaction log that's, that writes the operations, but, but uh, during checkpoints, then the state, the dirty, page, the dirty data pages are written out to the data, uh, to the data files and the checkpoints written to the transaction log, and the transaction log can be truncated. We don't need the operations in the, in the log after the checkpoints because we've saved the data, right? But if we just keep all the data in memory, then we never have to write it out to disk. We never have to write data to data pages. You, we just keep, keep the operations forever. We keep the transaction log forever. And that's, that sounds crazy if you have millions of operations per day or, or per hour, but a lot of domains pr have uh, oh, thousands per week. And we can, s we, can, we can go on for 20 or 30 years at, at that pace, and, and we won't fill up a hard drive. So a, l a lot of the systems that I work with, um, they're, pr they're pretty small. In, in, ter in terms of that. So the number of, uh, if you save all the operations uh, across the application's lifetime, lifetime, it's no problem. Okay, so, so that's a very simple idea, just, just saving the, the log forever and not writing state. It removes a lot of problems. And, and like I said, I was lazy. If, if uh, this was so easy to build, and if it, if it had been harder, I wouldn't have done it because I'm too lazy. So it's really easy. Okay, uh, this, isn't a, this idea is, it isn't new. It's uh, got a lot of names. Actually, like I mentioned, uh, that's what SQL Server does. It does write ahead logging, this is the name. So we write the transactions to the log. Not really because we're not writing the operations, right? We're not writing the text insert into. That's not what goes into the log. What goes into the log are the affected uh, data pages. So if we cr create new data pages, or, or update data pages or delete data pages, those are written to the log. It's called effect logging. So, so the transaction log in SQL Server is actually really big. But an operation in OrigoDB or op logging is, uh, they're smaller. I'll get back to that. The most common name for this, this concept is uh, system prevalence. Have, has anyone worked with Java and uh, Prevailer? It's probably the mo most uh, popular project using this pattern. You can check it out, Prevailer. It's uh, bad spelling there. Prevailer, okay, system prevalence. It's a Java project. Uh, MongoDB, no one uses that, right? All right. Got a bad reputation, unfortunately. Okay, they do something called op logging, and, th and they use that for replication. So it's not for persistence because they store the data, but they, they have an op log and they use it for replication so they can set up their replications. Because you replay the operations on the, uh, on the mirror or the replicas. Uh, Redis, anyone use that? Yeah, exact same thing there. They, they have an append-only file and the append-only file is, is a sequence of, of operations. Redis also uses snapshots. You can take a snapshot of the entire system state. All right, uh, memory image. If you follow Martin Fowler, he has a, a blog post about um, memory, the memory image pattern, but no references to any use. Or he just describes the pattern and he gives it the name memory image. All right, a Volt DB. Anyone try that? It's a relational database. It's, it's uh, rebuilt from scratch, and it's uh, all the data is in memory, and it just uses command logging. So it, it logs the operations in a transaction log and never writes data to, to uh, memory. I think you can do snapshots too. All right. So it's not a new concept. Okay. And also, yeah, Akka, is there an, uh, was there anyone at the workshop yesterday? Great. Uh, they can, uh, probably told you about uh, persistence, actor persistence. The actors are, you can have uh, persistent actors. 
so, so they survive system restarts and stuff. And, and active persistence uses the same, same, uh, same mechanisms. So you log all the operations. Every method call to a, or every message passed into an actor is captured and logged. And then we can replay those messages and, and restore the state of the actor. Yeah. You probably recognize this from event sourcing as well. It's really the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, but if it, it's, it's slightly different because events are something that happen after. We have a, c a command and we apply it to an aggregate and the aggregate generates events and we capture the events and we write them to the event store. And, or, and we have listeners that populate read models and, and so on. But it's the same, the same principle. We're, we're storing uh, the effects of the commands and not the, co the commands themselves. Okay, so it's not a new concept. Okay, okay, let's look at uh, OrigoDB. Yeah. All right, so at the, at the core we have an engine. In the middle of the picture we have the engine, and that's the thing you interact with. So the engine accepts uh, commands and queries. If you look up to the left, we have command and query objects. So our oper oper operations are either read or writes. And writes are commands and reads are queries. So the commands are, are, are logged through the storage model. So you pass the command to the engine and it will write it to send it to storage. See the storage there? And uh, we can have different backing stores. By default, it's, it writes the file. But you can plug in uh, SQL so you can have a table with all your commands. You, you can write to the event store. You can write 100,000 commands per second on my old laptop, old laptop, the laptop, with using event store. That's pretty good, right? 100,000 commands, and and so it's it's just the disk writes that's slowing it down because we have to flush to disk after every single um, command. Yeah, you can you can plug in your own storage if you'd like to write to some, some other backing store. Uh, so the formatting of the storage, it uses, um, by default, it's binary formatter, but you can plug in uh, protobuf or use J JSON. Yeah, so the kernel is responsible for uh, isolation, consistency, concurrency, the ACID part of the transaction. So, so it accepts the commands from the uh, engine and, and, qu and uh, queries and applies them to the model. And the commands are applied one at a time in sequence, serialized. Not really single-threaded single because it's a asynchronous, but one command at a time. So it's fully serializable isolation. And that, that's an isolation level you should be using in SQL Server. Because the default isolation level, it's not really isolated, is it? It's read committed to the default isolation level. Lots of uh, problems from that. Possibly, okay. Yeah, you see the model down there? The, the model is what you define. We, there's a base class called model and you have to derive from that and that's your, that's your projection of the database in memory. It's, it's, a, it's an interpretation of all the commands, starting with a, an empty model, an initial model, all the c commands applied to it. That's your model, that's your data in memory. And it's guarded by the kernel, so you can't access it directly. You can only access it through through the engine. So we're pr protecting you from from uh, concurrent access. And all right, engine storage kernel model. For yeah. So 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 what you do is you c define your model and you define your entities and and types. And you can do anything you like. You just use uh, .NET types and collections. And you define your operations as commands and queries. So you der derive from command, derive from query. Uh, and, and you interact with the engine by just passing commands and queries. We also have a server. The engine runs in process. You can, you can, uh, you can put this uh, in your ASP.NET ASP uh, application and you just run the engine and the model in process. But you have to turn off, turn off recycling, IES recycling. 
because if it recycles, then all this becomes garbage collected, and when, it, when the process starts up again, it has to replay all the commands from storage to re regenerate the model. And if it's really big, it can take five, 10, five, 10 minutes to restore the model. Okay, so, so that's the general architecture, and there, there's not much more to it, really. You write commands, queries, and you define your model, and that's all you do, and then you just, just run it with the engine, and the storage and the engine take care of everything for you. All right, and the, so the server, it's a standalone product. You can run it in a console, run it as a Windows service, and uh, so it listens on, on TCP or HTTP and accepts uh, commands and queries as JSON, so you can interact with it with, from different languages. We don't have any drivers or libraries yet, but it's, it's fully possible. You probably don't want to t talk to it directly with the JavaScript from the browser because we don't have any security at, at the moment. So you have to protect this uh, behind your firewalls, put something else, put your own web server with security in front of it. All right, so that's the architecture. Here's an example model. Here's some code. So this is the in-memory model, and it derives from a model. And you, you see it's marked uh, serializable. That's so you can uh, take snapshots. So if, if you're planning on using snapshots, you have to tag it with serializable. Well, and that's if you're using binary formatter. If you're using protobuf, then, then the procedure is slightly different. All right, so what do we see here? We see just a couple of um, collections, dictionaries. And you see I'm using a sorted dictionary. That's a good practice because if you use a regular dictionary, we found out the hard way, the d regular dictionary uses an underlying hash table. And when it gets really big, we have a lot of data. If you have like eight gigabytes of uh, memory in a single dictionary, what happens when, when the field factor reaches a certain point, it allocates a new array twice the size and it moves and copies all the data. So we, we were having performance issues just from that copying of data. But with the sorted dictionary, it's, it's, it works completely different because it uses um, um, a binary tree, a balanced tree. Okay. This is a very simple model because it's a, an example, but it can be as complex as, as you like. But basically, it's a, it's a container for all your data. It's, this is your, one instance of this model is your database. It's all your data in memory. Okay, so a command. It derives from a command, and it, it has the model as a generic uh, argument. It's also serializable. The commands have to be serializable because they're, they're being written to the journal, and also they're being replicated if you're using a, a server replication. You can see I'm using read-only fields, and that's because uh, to guarantee it's immutable. We, we don't want, you shouldn't be tampering with the command after it's been used. So you just create a command and you send it in as a message, and then you forget about it. You can also uh, c return things from commands. There's, a, there's an overload where the execute returns data. All right, so the execute method, that's where the things happens. That's where your operation takes place. You receive a reference to the, the in-memory model from the kernel. OK. Did I? Yeah, I'm back. Good. All right, some code there. You see, you can abort. You should uh, always check the model. So you should do validation before you do, do any modifications to, 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 the, to the model. Because if you fail in the middle somewhere, then you'll have an inconsistent model. You don't want to do a, little, a few changes and, th and then break in the middle of your operation. You have to guarantee that the state is uh, acceptable before you do any changes. If you abort, then you're signaling to the engine that, OK, uh, we didn't touch anything, so, so we're good. If we throw in an unexpected exception from here, then the engine will panic, and it will uh, throw away the entire model and rebuild it from, from scratch prior to this command, because it won't trust that you didn't touch the, touch the model. So it's protecting you. All right. So after our validation in the if, if uh, clause, we're creating a customer object, and we're putting it in the sorted dictionary.
by key. And we're using the grid that we passed in. One thing that's very important is that we use deterministic uh, commands. The behavior of the command has to be the same every time. We have to do the exact same change to the model every time because uh, the commands are being replayed when we res restore the system or we're moving, um, uh, replicating. So you wouldn't want to uh, use a grid, a new grid, call the new grid because it uses a random and, and other stuff, right? But then you get a new grid every time. You have to create the grid and put it as in an argument in the command. So it has to be deterministic. You don't either want to look at the date time, right? Look at the system clock during execution because it, it will have a different time when you execute. All right. Uh, something else you don't want to do, you, you don't want to have side effects in your command. You don't want to be sending mails or writing files or generating PDFs or something like that, right? You should do that outside of the context. The, the context here is just the persistence and the state of your domain model. All right. So a query, it's like a command, but it, uh, multiple queries can run in parallel. And queries, uh, obviously, don't, they don't modify the model. They shouldn't, but they can. There's nothing stopping you from, from touching the model in your execute of the query, but don't, because those changes will be lost next time you replay. That's actually a feature, it's something you can uh, utilize for dirty fixes. Okay, yeah, so this one's, this query executes, what does it do? Gets a customer about the, the grid, which is the ID of the customer we're looking for. And we're throwing an exception if the customer doesn't exist. Otherwise, we're returning a customer view. And this is, uh, if we look at these, these types, if we were to return the customer direct and the cu customer has references, to, for example, to all the orders that the customer has placed, and each order has uh, order items, and each item has references to products, then we'll be, that entire graph of objects would be returned. So I've defined a view called customer view that, that, that breaks these uh, references and flattens them and perhaps returns IDs to the products instead of references to the products themselves. So that's something you have to think about because your model is actually an object graph. And you, you have to be aware of how, it, how the references and links between the objects look when you're writing your queries and commands. Okay, so the model, we have a model, we have commands, and we have queries, and here's how we can use it. Okay, we're doing a grid. The second line there, we're creating an engine with a convenience method, engine four. So it's, it's basically saying, just give me a, a, an engine for this model. And there's no configuration here, but we could pass a configuration object uh, to that method, pointing out the location and, and, and other types of things. But it will, cre it will look for, in the config file, in the applic application configuration file for information. So we could get a remote, a proxy to a remote, um, a client to a, a server, a remote server. We can also get, uh, get a reference to a local engine. We're creating an add customer command object and we're executing it on the engine. And then we're executing a query and getting the customer view back. Pretty simple code. All right. Okay, so, so that was uh, some basic example code. And very brief, but uh, let's look at how this, these things map to uh, DDD. If we're looking at the concepts from the book, there's a concept called bounded context. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of isolation where you, you don't want to put too much in the same model perhaps in the same uh, namespace or in the same, uh, same module or assembly. You want to break things down in, into s separate parts, isolated contexts. And, and the, the model itself is, is a good uh, boundary for a bounded context. I, I like to compare bounded context to, to the models. If you if identified a bounded context, you should put that in a model. 
DDD, the DDD book also mentions the modules. So you can break, you can break a bounded context down into, uh, into separate namespaces if you, if you can is uh, identify separate isolated domains within, within the bounded context. Yeah, so entities. In value objects, you just use plain old uh, C-sharp object, objects. If you want a value semantics, you can uh, create immutable types or you can use structs. The book also mentions domain events, and you can model them, th those using POCOs. We have support for domain events. So d during the course of execution, while the command is executing, we can emit one or more events, and those events are collected and provided a, a, as a list of events, a collection of events, when the command is executed. Yeah, repositories, we don't really need. Aggregates, we, we don't really need them either because we're operated, we have exclusive access to the model while the command is executing, and we can touch any part of it. It doesn't matter how big the graph is or how, or how connected it is. So this aggregate concept, I, I think it's kind of obsolete, obsolete in this uh, context. Good. A few minutes left. I have a uh, few more slides I'd like to show. If you're working um, with 32-bit pointers, the, the maximum s size of your database is limited to f 4 gigs. That's a th theoretical maximum for 4 gigs. Actually, it's, it's a bit less, around 3 gigabytes. And, and then you'll get out-of-memory exceptions. But if you're running a 64-bit, then you can uh, work with more data. So that's a choice you have to make. And the server ships with 64 or 32-bit binaries, but the library is any CPU, so it depends on the application you're hosting it in. Hosting, I mentioned this, turn off recycling, implicit operations. Okay, if you think it's cumbersome writing commands and queries, then you can, you can use the methods on the model directly and, and have a proxy for them. So you don't have to write the commands, you just uh, call the methods and the methods will be translated to, to a generic type of command. It's, here's some code for that. So here's a, the same thing. I've added a method called add, pro add product to, uh, to, to the model. So I'm grabbing a proxy, commerce model proxy. From the engine, we're saying get proxy. And the thing uh, that we get back, it looks like the model, but it isn't. It's a proxy. And it intercepts all the method calls. And uh, so when we say proxy add product, th that will get intercepted and will get written to the log pr transparently. All right. And OK. Anything else? Querying, you can query with link. Link is great, right? Link to objects. Everything link is that's, it's pretty powerful. You, you can, we can pass link as strings through the web interface. So I like to, I like to th think of link as the new uh, SQL. Good. Anything more? No. Oh. I have a few more slides, but I'll save them for another day, or p perhaps you have some questions. OK, uh, yeah. OK, I'm finished. <laughs> Good. Oh. Yeah, I, th I, th I think you should, please, you should try this out, because you, you don't really get it until you've, you've tried it. It, most people, they don't really understand, but if you try it, you'll, you'll discover a lot of subtle things. And uh, if, please give me some feedback. Tell me something, whatever you find out or learn. I'd, li I'd really appreciate your feedback. And there's a lot to do in the project if you'd like to help out. There's a lot of advanced things we're working on, uh, both simple and advanced things. It's an exciting project, and we're only a few people, and we'd like to, be, like to have more contributors. So there's the URL, and there's uh, my Twitter, email. Just get in touch. If you have questions, you can 
we can have, take them now or whenever. I'll be hanging out, hang around here the, tomorrow and Wednesday. Okay, any questions now? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, since you mentioned it with the sorted dictionary, yeah. No, 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 not really. No, no, haven't. No. No. Okay, good, thanks. All right, well, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, that wraps up the talks for today. Uh, do you want to, could you do me a favor and pull up um, 